Okay, um, good evening everyone. Uh, I hope everyone understands English. That's going to make it a lot better the next two hours or something. Um, I'm sorry for being a bit late and stuck in traffic here. Uh, it's my first time in Sao Paulo and, and why does it rain all the time? <laughs> like, stop doing that. I'm from Sweden. When I travel somewhere, it's supposed to be warm, okay? <laughs> so, I've traveled a far way to, to be here. Um, and uh, and like I said, I come from Sweden. Um, you need to know that you're welcome any day you want to. Okay? And also, yes, everything you heard is true. <laughs> and what you also need to know in Europe that we have the euro currency in, in most of the countries in Europe. But they did something interesting the first time they printed the euro coin is that they decided to leave out the countries that weren't in the European Union. So the way the first version looks is a bit awkward. <laughs> uh, so the, the problem now, wherever I travel somewhere, is like, oh, I'm from Sweden. It's like, oh, you're the penis of Europe. <laughs> But, uh, you know, at least we're not Finland on the side, so it, it could be worse. Um, so I work for Mozilla, uh, and, uh, well, basically what we do, and, and I guess most of you know that, but basically what we do with Mozilla is that we're a non-profit, and our, our point, our existence is basically, basically making sure that the web is open for everyone, and that everyone can take part of it. Uh, it, it's basically just making sure that users are in control and not just big corporations are owning everything. We make a web browser, and we have some good competition there, uh, which is good. Uh, most people ask now when Google Chrome is getting really good, and we have Opera and Safari, and we have, what well, we do still have Internet Explorer, uh, is that, you know, oh, that must be a bad thing. But that's a good thing for us. We're winning because the way we want it is the way it, it is right now. You have a good balance between different web browsers. <coughs> Everyone's competing. If you just look at web browser performance the last couple of years, and JavaScript performance is getting so much better. And that's what happened when you have competition. And we need that. So it, it's a good thing for us. We also work with standards. So, you know, apologies to my American <laughs> friends, but we like things when they're standardized, okay? So, I mean, this is, I'm moving around here now, I have two tweets. Uh, like, in this case, 760 yards to a mile. That's not a system, right? That's just a... <laughs> <laughs> so, the general idea that we do with Mozilla is that everything we work on is to create standards, and to make sure that the standards are standardizable and interoperable. So it works on all platforms, on all operating systems, all kinds of devices, because it's the way it should be. I tweet a lot. I'm, I'm better at tweeting than before. I actually tweet remotely useful things nowadays. Um, so about HTML5 and about the open web and APIs and things we're working on. So I wanted to start first with showing a, a project. How many of you have heard about collusion? No one. Oh, well. I, I showed five in the back just because I went before I went up there. <laughs> so basically, collusion um, it's not that kind of scare propaganda, but the idea with collusion is to make sure that you know when you go to a website what happens. Like, how much does the website know about you, and which other websites get to know more about you as well? So we'll see if the Wi-Fi is working, which it isn't anymore. Okay. If one will try, otherwise I can show you later. That's the thing, always when you have a, something that's live. Yeah. So I'll show you later. But basically what it does, it shows you, as you can see in this screen, like if you go to a website here, let's say go to a music website, any kind of website, it also sends all the other websites that get connected to that site. So it could be ad scripts or similar, <coughs> but it can also be you know, Facebook, Twitter, anything else. And defined by different colors, you're going to know if it's a, a bad website 
or if it's just another website. So I mean, connecting to other websites could be okay, but it's also about for you to know that what's going on. So it's not like, no, I can't use the internet ever again. It's just more about knowing that if I go here, it's gonna share this data with that, that, and that website. So it's more about the awareness. If you're fine with sharing your data, fantastic. But you should know that it happens. Uh, is, is it related to the panopti click from EFF? Sorry, if it's panopti click from EFF, it's a it's a project that uh, reserves um, user tracking by browser fingerprinting. Based on the right. versions of all of your plugins, there are sites that track you all around the internet to know what you're doing and then to generate yeah. data advertisements. Right. So it's, so it's pretty similar to that. Yes. Uh, so basically, in this case, it's just an example that, that goes through the traffic within your web browser, and it sees from you know if it makes a request from which website did that request originate. Uh, when I have a connection, if I have a connection, I'll, I'll be more than happy to show you later. So in this first talk, I'm generally going to talk about HTML5 and, and things that are going on. There. Um, and the question is, what is HTML5? And if you ask a, a journalist, they're going to say many, many different things. If you're going to ask a company, they're going to say that they work with HTML5 because people are going to use them then and make more money. And you know, all that's okay if you want to write it way. But in reality, what it means is two different things it's semantics, which is basically just having a richer way to write HTML code, and it's about different JavaScript APIs. I think right now it's up to over a hundred different specifications with different APIs that you could say is HTML5. So some of them are, some of them aren't. For me personally, it doesn't make that much bigger a difference because they're all sort of interconnected. You know, one API is fine, but when you start connecting to different APIs, it's when it becomes interesting and then you can create amazing things. And of course, it's also building things for any kind of platform you can imagine out there and any kind of future platform you can imagine as well. So it's the way of, you know, oh no way, I think I have at least one Paula, right? Java programmer, right? So I would say I've done my homework, but someone just told me. Uh, but um, so like the general idea with Java, you know, you were supposed to write something once and it was going to run everywhere. It didn't really work that time around. Uh, We'll see if it's going to do that this time around. But the general idea here is basically to have something, and, and looking the way it's going right now with all the major companies supporting it, we, we're, we've come a, a, a long way, and, and at least it looks promising right now. And so basically, HTML5 is fantastic. <laughs> it, it's the second coming, Jesus is back. Like, this is a fan poster from the 80s. So if you're in the Star Wars fan club, you can get this poster. But then the internet came along, and now everyone can get this person. So, another controversial <laughs> thing. It's not really controversial anymore. Uh, personally, I don't think so. Or, you know, it, it, I don't think Flash can die for many, 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 many years. And we don't really need that either. I think Flash is going to be around, but it's going to be around for different things, for like video that needs DRM and things like that. And look at what Flash can do right now. We're not there yet with HTML5. And, and you need to be realistic about that. You can't not say, OK, we hate this, throw it out. But if, if people are building websites out there, and they need to build experience. If this is the only way to do it, you need to respect that. They need to make a living. And all the things that we see from Flash, I would rather that we take all the good experience from there, like with animations, with performance, not things called well, performance, but it used to be better. Uh, and then build something better than that and open. I love to see Flash be open, it's never gonna happen. But, you know, rather learn from Flash and see what we can do and implement in our code. So, looking at semantics, how do we make the HTML code richer? Um, we kind of tried with XHTML, especially with XHTML2. Problem was that it wasn't backwards compatible. And it's pretty hard to deploy something to the entire world, like we said with XHTML2, and just think that everyone's going to upgrade. We all know with people upgrading web browser, it's not really happening. So with semantics, it's basically adding a number more elements to HTML to make it richer. 
Uh, and semantics is basically about structure. <laughs> um, I like to define the approach here, just trying to understand what they actually look like beneath the clothes. <laughs> So, if you start from the top, if you have a web page um, and you want to have a character encoding, the way we've done it for a number of years is basically just that we specified, okay, the content type is going to be text, text HTML and the character set is going to be UTF-8. Um, so with HTML5, it's about being pragmatic and not just like, okay, this would be the perfect way to do it if you're trying to get a master's degree at university, fine. But, how do web browsers actually read this code? And it turned out they're just reading blah, 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 UTF-8, blah, 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 blah. So let's make it easier. So this works right now in every web browser out there. And that's pretty much what all the changes with 2HTML in HTML5 uh, is about. Just to make sure that okay, it works. It does what you want to in the most simple manner possible. Because, I mean, there's no need for it to be extra complicated if it doesn't make a difference with the result. We're also getting a number of new uh, HTML elements. So Google did the research for, I think it was a billion web pages, just looking at the class names that people were using. And surprisingly, it was, you know, header, footer, navigation, things like that. So why don't we have elements like that? So they started to implement elements like that in the what working group which is started working on the HTML5 specification. And what you need to know here is also that it's not like a header, it's not a one-time thing you use. You can use 15 headers in the same page. It's all about being content context specific. So let's say you have a web page with different squares, and each square could be like its own module, and then you have a header for that module, and then you have a section for that module, and a footer for that module, etc. So it's not about placement in the page, it's rather it's meaning to that part of the page. <coughs> and we're also trying to make forms better. Uh, and, and forms are like, I, I think working with forms on the web is the things that sort of weed you out. Like if you survive working with forms, you're worthy of being a web developer. So you kind of need to go through that kind of rite of passage. So with forms, it's basically everyone is building their own JavaScript for validation or their own JavaScript for date pickers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And that could be a fun exercise if, if that's your thing. Most people don't like that. So in this case, it's a big red O here, and it's just to give them credit because Opera has by far the best implementation by HTML form. It has five forms right now: um, WebKit with Chrome and, and Safari is pretty good and they're catching up. With Firefox, sensitive, turn off the camera. Uh, with Firefox, uh, we're, we're having implemented that much. We have some of the things, um, some things we don't. Um, for two main reasons, actually. One of the reasons is that we have all of these new elements, but it's not clearly specified how they're supposed to look or work. It's just more like, in, in this case, let's say that you want a, a date picture date and time. Uh, it's not specified how it's supposed to look and how it's supposed to work. The other problem there is that there's no way to style it. And, and every engineer is going to argue that there is no need to style it. It's going to look the same all over and that's the way it should be. And that's you know all good and well, but that's not the way it works. People want to brand their controls. And if we don't make it possible to alter the look of them, people are not going to use them. You know, sure, it's okay if the day is built into the web browser, you don't have to code it. But if it looks like shit, which it usually does when an engineer implements it, um, you don't want to have it in your website. If you have a pretty website, all the fancy colors, you know, rounded corners, yay, or, you know, um, animating circles or ellipses in and out, and then you have an ugly form control. So, where we are right now, it, you know, it seems like the most focus is more going into eye candy than forms at the moment, to be honest. For, for us and for all the players. But to talk about forms, I mean, in, in general, the idea is very good that you're going to have ways to choose a color and, and to have placeholder text automatically and things like that. 
autofocus, which is, of course is going to be overused right away. Um, but we also have email fields or uh, search fields. And, and with these fields, it's more about connecting a validation term. So if you have an email field, uh, and you can say that that field is required, the web browser is going to validate for you. Um, so you don't need to know, write an enormously long regular expression to actually validate an email address, which is okay, because it's quite tricky if you want to do it properly. And with search, uh, the only thing connected with the search field is basically just marking it up semantically. So you can distinguish a search field from a text field, and that's it. Well, the other difference is that if you use Mac OS X, you're going to get rounded corners, and Windows, you're going to get square corners, and Linux as well. So, if you talk about forums, uh, who should you actually listen to? Uh, what I would recommend, uh, one guy is a, a Dutch guy called Peter Holcroft, or PBK, and he's done a lot of research on just checking how internet development work in different web browsers. Uh, we also need to know, I should actually say, um, here that with all these fields, that all of these new form types, is that if you have a form type search or a number, etc., and your web browser doesn't support it, it's not going to break the experience. So the fallback in web browsers, if it doesn't understand the type, it's going to be a text field. So that's okay. So then you can see that it is a text field, and you can build things on top of it. Uh, PBK has also done research on, on different mobile phones, how well input fields actually work. There's also a company called Bufu, uh, I think that's the right way to say it. And Bufu is basing their entire business on top of um, building rich reform experiences. And they have a lot of compatibility tables and they have a lot of recent tests. You can try directing the web browser and see how your browser actually works. And then, coming back to the flash thing, is that with HTML5, we're going to have video. And when we have a video element, it's going to be the flash killer on the web. So, you know, every time a journalist asks me, they think that, okay, now we have video, we don't need flash anymore. It's about so much more than that. But the thing with video, and, and one of the projects we're involved in, is universal subtitles. And what I like about this is, you know, surprisingly, the world doesn't always speak English. There are more languages out there. Um, so the idea is that you can upload a video or have a video on YouTube and link to that. And with this project, you can go in and find a video clip, and you can add your own translation in your language. So it's just a project to make sure that as many as possible of people in the entire world can take part of the content. And that's what we need. We need people to be able to see content and to actually understand content without having to learn a new language. And in some countries, learning English, for instance, is you know, not the first option on the list. You can also go in there, you can fix some other person's text and on, you know, work together and things like that. We also have a project called PopcornJS, and it's basically about making the web browser or video on the web slightly richer than just a video. So the idea is that you have timestamps in your video. So when you get to a certain time point in your video, you're going to show related content. So if you show him flying his kite, and you're going to see on a map where it's actually taking place. And, uh, <coughs> and what's that? Oh, Christ. Uh, and if you have a video with Will Ferrell, you're going to see the tweets about Will Ferrell at that time. So it's just basically making content richer and having related content connected to video. And PopcornJS is a JavaScript framework just to make sure that you can connect video to any kind of content. We also have, and it's really in an alpha state, I should say, uh, the butter app. You know, butter goes with popcorn and a half. So, so the idea with the butter app is basically having a visual interface where you can see the video and you know, a little video editor, not even editor, but you have a timeline and you set different markers. And as you can see on the right hand side, you can connect it to a map or flicker or something like that. Being Swedish, I have to talk about IKEA. It's mandatory by law, I can't help it. <laughs> So 
So what IKEA did, uh, which is quite nice, is that you have a video here. But as you scroll down the video, it's not just videos overlapping, but you also get cross-fading sound. So depending on how much you scroll, you're going to hear more from this video than the video up here. And looking at code, it's quite easy. The, the idea is that you have a video element, you have an attribute stating if you want to have visible web browser controls for the video, play, pause, etc. And then you have a source attribute, where you just point to the video that you're going to show. And what I also like here, and which is different from just using Flash or something like that, is that video is just any other element in the page, just like you know, a div or something like that. Uh, so if we had a video like this um, from NASA about the moon landing, the thing is that you can just use CSS on top of this and you can manipulate the video. And you can also rotate the video, but you still have the native controls in the web browser. And this is, you know, not, nothing extra uh, needed. It's just part of the general web browser experience. Uh, and you can also use SVG, like scalable vector graphics. And you can make filters with them, and you can just overlay the video with that. So if you want to make sure that it's you know, even more unclear, you have a blur filter. Or you can invert the colors, or do black and white, or noir. And it's all happening in real time. You just have the video. So I think that's the, the real power of HTML5 and CSS complemented. You do it all together. It's, it's all these forces come together that make a difference. Canvas. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, we, we all knew that Internet Explorer was the kid eating glue, right? So, the idea of Canvas and this picture is basically about drawing and it's starting to allow games as well. And with Canvas, it's basically like a drawing board directly in the web browser. In this case, it's a music video for a band. And the idea is basically that all of these small parts are videos playing in Canvas. And then you can break out every video, and you're supposed to finish the puzzle before the video ends. Um, I didn't make it in time, so I'm going to move on now. It's also about you know, making things pretty, pretty so important. So you can make any kind of drawing, and then we can draw things on a canvas from there. So it's not just about pixels anymore, but you have actually drawing points, and you can do arcs and lines, etc. So it's, it's, then the way you code it is like a pen on a paper. But except for those projects, we also have a program in Mozilla called PDFJS. And if you're using, especially Windows, if you ask me, and if you want to watch a PDF file, it's quite painful. Uh, or it has been for a long time, you need accurate reader, etc. The idea with PDFJS is in JavaScript, have a PDF interpreter. So if you want to load the PDF file directly in the web browser, you go through this library and then you can see the contents of the PDF file. You know, no plugins, no dependencies, you just see the content. So it's just one extra step to try and eliminate um, plugins you don't need. So it doesn't support everything in PDF, but it supports most of the basic things. You can get a thumbnail view and go through and read text, etc. And in the, the latest versions of Firefox that nicely releases, uh, it's in there as well. <coughs> so looking at the code for working with Canvas, it's, it's the same as video, basically. You have a Canvas element, you give it an ID, and you give it its dimensions, the width and the height. And everything from there on happens in JavaScript. So you get a reference to that element, but you also get a reference to the element's context. So it's going to be two-dimensional in this case. And then you can just start drawing. So you set the fill style in this case, it's going to be red. Then you use the fill rect method. And all of these methods, like fill rect, the first coordinates are the position, the x and the y within the canvas. Like where do you want to start? Top left corner. Okay? And then how wide is it going to be and how high how high is it going to be? You can also use clear rect, so basically if you draw something in there and use clear rect, you're just clearing a rectangle in the middle. And that's one of a few options that you can do 
Because with Canvas, as opposed to working with SVG, Canvas doesn't create any DOM elements. You can't access just a line within the Canvas. The Canvas is just a big blank paper. So if I were to draw something here, um, to keep on drawing something is harder. So it's just easier to erase it with something like KRX and then start over, start over, start over. And Canvas is quite performant, so that's why you can do it. And that's why it's a good option to build games as well. So with the history of the AI, um, it's something we should have a long, long time ago. Like you remember with when Ajax came and everyone was doing everything with Ajax, and as soon as you did something with JavaScript, it was Ajax. Um, the problem, though, is that with Ajax, and we, we have this um, in many different cases. Like if you were going to a website and they were using Ajax, and they were doing dynamic updates to the web page. But, uh, you know, and you click around 15 times, and you click the back button, and everything is gone. So the idea with the History API is in the web browser that you, as a developer, can push things into the web browser history. So if you get content dynamically, you can just push something in through the History API. I think especially, is there anyone here working for a bank? No? So my, my pet hate, and maybe it's just Swedish banks, but my pet hate is bank websites. Because if you go to a bank website, it's, it's always, you know, if you click the back button, at least in my banks, they're the ones I ever used, uh, the bank starts yelling at you. Like, it's like, no, no, you're doing it wrong. We spent a lot of money to build our shit navigation, so you have to use that. <laughs> uh, and it's so annoying. So I think that's why history API is so important, just to make things easier for users. Because we have back and forward buttons in the web browser for a reason. That's, a, that's how we use most websites, why can't you use all websites like that? And looking at the code for that, basically in web browsers we had the history object for a long time. And now we have a new method called push state. And the push state basically takes three different parameters. The state that you can push in, which is a JavaScript object, the title of the page you want to have there, and the actual URL of the page. So in this case, uh, for instance, you can have a URL that will be my website. You can have a title you want to be able to have a state object. And the state object, you can pretty much put everything you want to. It's more a way for you to reference it later. Uh, as far as I know, the, the, the one in the middle, the title attribute, uh, or the title parameter, doesn't work in, in the web browser right now. It's going to be in there. Uh, and there's someone uh, called Mark Pilgrim. So he decided to disappear from the internet. But before he did, he wrote this history API demo. And as you see in the URL bar, as it keeps on scrolling, it gets content through a dynamically. And you know, like any news website or something like that. But when you reload, you still have that thing in the URL, so it gets all the content that you got the last time you were scrolling. So that's the upside of the history API. You just keep on pushing things in there, and you know what to get. WebSockets is like Ajax on steroids. You never see an after picture, right? So before WebSockets, uh, people were trying to do all kinds of things. And the whole idea is having a bi-directional communication. With Ajax, we could keep on asking the web server all the time, you know, data, data, give me more data. But with WebSockets and having something that is bi-directional, it's being able to push something from the web server. The, the web client or the web browser doesn't have to keep on asking for things, but are like, okay, now we have new data here. Here you go, present it. And people are doing things like, um, like comment, the comment. If you heard about that, and, and doing HTTP polling, and, and especially. Um, phone calling, keeping requests alive and things like that, which is hacky and it works. So the idea with WebSockets is that it's all built in. Um, we're having a new protocol, the WS protocol for WebSockets. If you want to have a secure connection, you have WSS. So in JavaScript, you create a new WebSocket object. Uh, it just points to a URL. And then you have a few methods. You can just send some data to the server, you can just close the connection if you want to. 
But the way you can also do it is that you have different commands. You have when the connection is open. I'm sorry, would you mind? Guys? Hello? Hi. Would you mind? Sorry. Well, you also have a number of different events. Uh, so you have the open event when the connection actually is open, and you can close it in an error. But the interesting one here is the message event. And the message event in the web browser is when the web server is pushing something to the client. Like I have a new stock right now, or new news or something. You get that event and then you can present that data. So right now it is in a, a few web browser versions, but if you want to use it, there are a couple of libraries, uh, like the WebSocket.js or Socket.io, and basically they build it on top of everything that's available out there. They, you know, they have no pride. They use Flash, they use Comment or similar things. But it's basically just about, you know, see, again, being pragmatic. I want to deliver this experience to the end user. What do I have to do? Well, I can use WebSockets and browsers that do support it, but I can have fallbacks for every other web browser. Geolocation is basically, you know, the, the stalker feature. <laughs> and naturally, you know, talking about the integrity and all that, is that in the web browser, if you ask the user for where they are, uh, the web browser is going to ask you, like, is it okay? Do you want to share this with this website? And if you go to Google Maps, you might have noticed there's a small dot at the top. You have the nav navigation panning and <coughs> zooming, etc. We also have a dot, and if you click that dot, it's going to center the map to where you are at the moment. And naturally, you can utilize the Google Maps API to just find directions to tell it like, I am here right now, I want to get here, how the hell do I do it? And the code is really simple to work with geolocation. You have a geolocation object, and that object has a few methods. And the most important one is get current position. And when you call get current position, you get a dialogue, the user says yes, most of the time. Uh, and then you get the latitude and longitude, and then you can map it out, or whatever you want to do to work with it. There's also another uh, method called watch position, and watch position does it all the time. So if you're going to kill someone's cell phone battery, you know, go ahead and use it. It's, it's very appreciated. And drag and drop. <laughs> <coughs> oh, sorry. I'll get back to that actually. I think I have to slice another one. Uh, it's probably better to skip over dragging it off anyway. You'll see why later. Um, let's see if I have that. Yeah. So, uh, and also with offline web applications, the idea with offline web applications is basically just to make sure that you can keep on working. Like in web browsers, you have the file menu and you can choose to work <coughs> offline, but that kind of takes a, a, a step from the user. The user has to explicitly say that, okay, I'm gonna go offline now. You know, if you're on a train or on the way into a tunnel, if you're not fast enough, it's not gonna work. So the, the basic idea here is that the user shouldn't have to think about it. You as a developer set things up. If they lose the connection, it's up to you to make sure they have the same experience or a similar experience. So we had a few ways to try and detect that. So we have online and offline events, just different code branching depending on web browser. <coughs> and honestly, I have to say that these events work best in Internet Explorer, uh, which is always surprising, right? Makes you happy in Internet Theory Guide. Um, and the idea here is, of course, that if you use Wi-Fi and you turn off Wi-Fi, um, this event gets triggered sometimes most web browsers, not all the time. If you have an Ethernet cable and you pull it out, um, same thing. Um, on the other hand, in all web browsers, if you actually use work offline in the file menu, it works in all of them. But that's kind of what we want to get away from. And it's, it's getting more stable, but it's kind of hard to detect as well, because if you have Wi-Fi, you, know, you can lose your connection to your router, and that's fine. Then you know that, then you're offline. Uh, well, what happens if you have a connection to the router, but not from the router to the internet? So it's kind of hard to know wh where do you draw the line, wh what is online and what is offline. You know, as a user, you know that this shit doesn't work, that's offline for me, but you know, how do you distinguish that? You can also, which is never a, a recommended approach, you can just keep on polling uh, the server. 
or as not the server, the, the client, and you can just check if you are online. You have an online property, so you can check every second, like, am I online, am I online, am I online? Which is kind of annoying, it's kind of not that good for performance. So the idea with HTML5 is basically that you have an HTML5 page, and then we have a manifest attribute. And the manifest attribute just points to an app cache file. And the idea with the app cache file is that within that file, you list all the files that you want to be available if you lose the connection. And the way it looks, first you have a directive just saying that, okay, this is a manifest file. Then you have three different directives. You have cache, fallback, and network. And under cache, you list all the files that are supposed to be available if you lose the connection. You know, no matter what happens, you lose the connection, these files are already downloaded. So if you go to a website that has an like, app cache file listing these files, as soon as you go to that page the first time, it asks you, is it okay to source things offline on your client? Yes, and then source all those files. The fallback directive is that the first file name you see there, online.css, is the one that's gonna be used if you're online. If you lose your connection, it defaults to the other file automatically. You don't have to have a JavaScript event or something like that. It just works. Magic. Computers. And the third one with network is basically just specifying if the user tries to access any of these paths, uh, you have to be online. You notify the user that, I'm sorry, it just doesn't work. You have to be online to get the exact data. And talking about Canvas before, uh, we had complete different beast called WebGL, which is basically doing things with Canvas, but in a three-dimensional context. So last fall, I think, was a uh, few of my colleagues in, so that in the audio team, uh, in the spare time, because they were bored, they decided to build a 3D city, because that's what you do when you're bored, right? Um, right, true. Those two, right? My Minecraft with 3D city. Like it's Thursday day on the city. So what it has as well has the audio that's being synced with the ship flying around. But everything you see here is JavaScript. It's just WebDL drawing things on a canvas in a three-dimensional context. And all the things that you see in the buildings as well, like the videos and pictures, etc., are being retrieved live. I and mean, this is a video, but if you go to the actual website, it's live. So you just specify a hashtag that you know, if you want to have Sao Paulo as a hashtag, you can get all the videos and pictures that, are, that has that hashtag live. Someone else decided to do a walking skeleton. Uh, I always wondered about the top slider, like female or male, is that a slider? <laughs> I, I kind of thought it was an on and off thing. <laughs> Maybe I'm old fashioned, I don't know. Um, and actually when you have something like this, you, you want to max out the different values. So what if you have a female, light, nervous, happy one? <laughs> <laughs> kind of giddy. <laughs> but the idea is that, that it's quite easy. So you just have a different number of points, that, and that's the way you work with it. So you have these different points on the skeletons, you just draw textures on top of those points. You don't need that many points, it's just those things that are moving. And we also drew the, this 3D face, and this is a bit scary actually, because it starts becoming too realistic. Like when you do the screencast of this, I'm just terrified it's going to wake up. Uh, but, but again, it, it's all just JavaScript. Uh, Google will work on this project, this is released under another name right now. But basically if you have a body and you want to look through it, um, you, know, you can zoom in and look around. But Google strength here, of course, is search. So if you go for legs, you can get a, a time through or cut through of the actual body and see the different parts. And if you search for biceps, you know, you have biceps in your legs too, apparently, uh, you can see exactly what they look like. And the nice thing here is that, you know, that now it's actually becoming useful. You know, a, a shift in a 3D city, that's fine. But this is actually something that, you know, you can see parts. You can use this as a doctor or an artist or if you're just curious. Coding with WebDL, though, is pretty different. Uh, it's basically a lot of math and a lot of different values, like a lot of it is math. And, and, you know, if, if this makes you happy, that's fantastic. Uh, but, you know, Sometimes you just want to get things done. Um, 
So the idea here, and as we saw for instance with the 3D face, is there's a library called 3JS. And 3JS is just trying to make it as easy for you as possible to do things in 3D. So they have lots of different examples on how you start trying things. And usually when we talk about all the things, you get the questions. Um, usually not questions like this. But, uh, well, you know, my reply would be yes. Um, and when you get these questions, it's always like, is H15 ready? And that's the question year after year. And you know, the other question, is it going to be around? Is it worth me wasting my time learning this, and then it's going to die? So talking about if it's ready, um, it's in all the major web browsers. And all the major web browser vendors are putting a lot of money and a lot of time into doing it. Like everyone has agreed that this is the way we should do it. You can always figure about details, but as a whole, this is the direction we're going in. And looking at mobile phones as well, that um, in iOS and in Safari and iOS is getting better and better. Um, unfortunately, the only browser you can have on that phone. Um, and looking at Android and looking at Blackberry as well, but it's getting richer and richer, especially if we talk about Android, that uh, Firefox and Android, we're going to have a pretty good beta in a weeks, I hope, uh, with a native UI that is quite fast. And if you look at uh, Google Chrome beta uh, on Android, it's really good too. So, so there you have two quite powerful web browsers. So you have choice and performance on a mobile phone. And also, and I heard that before, that uh, well, I hope it's true, uh, that in Brazil that people aren't very good at updating their web browsers. And that's, that's you know, that could be a problem. But there's also something reference to as a polyfill. And the idea with a polyfill is that's like we saw before, that talking about web sockets, I'm going socket IO and similar. And what it does, a polyfill, is to check in the web browser, does it support web sockets or does it support canvas or something like that? If yes, use that. But if it doesn't, fall back to something else that works in a web browser. Do whatever you can, but make sure it works. So you have all of these different uh, polyfill libraries. Um, that just you know lists different options for you to work with. Another website is canIuse.com, and this website is basically you just enter a feature you want to look for, and you can see which web browser support it, and also how long they've supported it. I think it goes at least two versions back. So you can also see that okay, how long has this been around, and also how many web browsers have agreed to implement this. You know, if it's only one, it kind of gives you. you know, kind of know how about, you know, probably not a good idea right now. And then the other question is going to be around, um, if we're talking about web browser before, if we take about the, talk about the company <coughs> with all the money in the entire world, more or less, um, they're all betting on it as well. Um, I mean, if you're looking at Microsoft and you look at Windows 8, then you're going to build HTML5 apps in Windows 8 as native apps on that platform. Google has been doing it for a long time. Apple is doing it as well, especially if you talk about different iOS devices. Facebook is building a lot of things with HTML5, and Adobe, um, so last year, actually even a year ago, uh, they bought Nitobe, which is the company that makes PhoneGap, and they're building a lot of new services around that as well. So everyone is putting money into it. So, the other part here, of course, is the way that people look at it. Uh, like from one of my favorite South Park episodes, and they have their business plan. And step one is collect all underpants. Step two, no idea. And step three is profit. And that pretty much sounds like most business plans I've come across. So the idea here is, you know, please play around with HTML5, but make sure why you're doing it. Like you're aiming for a better user experience or something, not just doing it for, okay, it's, it's the new hype work, I'm gonna do it for the sake of it. And it's also about trying new things and seeing things from a new perspective. Like the, the Berlin Symphonic Orchestra, they put macro cameras into their instruments. This is the inside of a violin. And you know, just creating new worlds by looking from a different perspective. And that's all it takes. And you can fail. It's okay. Uh, hopefully not this bad. But you can fail, and that's okay. The, the, the whole point is that it's so much better to try something and fail because you're going to learn something from that instead of just 
not doing anything. And uh, I'll have to read this if you haven't seen it. <laughs> so the, the point here, of course, is that you find anything, anything you learn, share it on the web. You know, share code on GitHub, take part in discussion forums, or blog about it, or something. Uh, I mean, the biggest problem usually you have something like this, and then Denver Coder Nine has replied to himself saying, "Don't worry, I found a solution," and then nothing more. Right? And we don't want a web like that. We want a web where you share what you actually found. So instead of you know fighting and, and you know should we have seven calls in JavaScript or not, or very important discussion like that, we can actually put it into helping each other and moving forward together. So that's it for part one. Thank you.